The lawman drew in a breath of smoke from his dwindling cigarette. He and his man had been waiting in the ditch all night, and he was tired, hungry, and stiff. The plan had been to wait for the pair to come past them under the cover of nightfall. Then they would spring their trap. But there was no sign of the couple. As the sun rose and the daylight began to illuminate the dirt road they were perched next to, he was ready to call it. Then the faint sound of an engine broke through the early morning silence. He listened hard, almost praying it wasn't his imagination. But the sound was getting closer and it was now the unmistakable sound of a Ford V8 making its way up the road towards them. It's Barrow! One of the men shouted. They had spent the entire night checking and double-checking their weapons, but they each instinctively gave them one last check. Safety off, round in the chamber, steady now. The car puttered up the road, now just a few dozen yards from them, when the lawman stepped out of the brush and drew his 35 caliber Remington Model 8 rifle. The car came to a sudden stop as his eyes met with Barrows. He then looked to his left, and his eyes met with those of the woman in the passenger seat. Sure enough, it was Bonnie Parker. Everything seemed to just stop, and he was about to open his mouth to speak when Barrow went for his BAR. Virtuous Men, a podcast devoted to sharing the lives of men of history, fiction, and today, and the virtues they personify. Over the course of this season, we'll explore the lives of five men who each exemplified a crucial virtue of life with not just their words, but their actions. From these men, we hope you will learn that a life of virtue is something you can achieve, no matter the obstacle. Welcome to Episode 2, The Law and Order of Frank Hamer. Part 2, hosted by Jamie Adams, with expert insight from John Bosnecker, author of the book The Epic Life of Frank Hamer, The Man Who Killed Bonnie and Clyde. A virtue is a behavior one conforms to in order to achieve a moral and ethically principled life through action. A virtuous man is one who is well aware of how he falls short, yet chooses not to allow his flaws to define him as he seeks to better himself. Such men show that it is possible to overcome the things that keep us from achieving our destinies. Though each man is flawed and imperfect, it is in the lives of flawed men that we see the possibility for virtue in our own lives. This episode's virtue is law and order. Law and order is the respect and obedience of the rule of law in society. This is something that is easily thought up and written down on paper, but is much harder to implement in the real world. It requires strength to counter lawlessness. And it requires a steady hand, cool temper, and a balanced view of judgment and compassion. The legends of great lawmen of history bring us back to the times of the Old West, and to violent days of gangsters and bootleggers. One such legendary lawman was Frank Hamer, He lived through some of the most violent times in American history, yet he managed to quell some of the most notorious crime sprees during his 40 years in law enforcement. Many have called him the greatest American lawman of the 20th century. By exploring Hamer's life, we will seek to learn a lesson from the past, that without law and order, and those in place to enforce it, society is only one step away from anarchy. We're joined in this episode by author John Bosnecker, John is a former law enforcement officer and lawyer, and has always had a passion for frontier history. He has authored nine books about the lawmen and outlaws of the Old West, none more celebrated than his New York Times bestseller, The Epic Life of Frank Hamer. Part 2. The Manhunt The tremendous crowds which you see gathered outside the stock exchange 
are due to the greatest crash in the history of the New York Stock Exchange in market prices. October 29th, 1929, is the day we now know as Black Tuesday. On this day, the New York Stock Exchange had the greatest crash in its history up until that point. Though the Roaring Twenties were a time of great wealth and excess in America, real estate had been in decline throughout the decade. But as stocks began to slide lower and lower, investors began to lose trust in their investments, a panic sell ensued, and the market collapsed, resulting in what we now call the Great Depression. The market would not reach its bottom for another four years, and unemployment would remain in double digits until the start of World War II, when wartime military service and manufacturing spurred the American economy out of its long slumber. It was during this time that one particular couple would leave an indelible mark on criminal history in America. One grew up in Teleco, Texas, the other in Rowena, Texas. They met at the onset of the Great Depression in 1930, and then their gang would wage a path of lawlessness and death across much of the South and Midwest over the next few years. Their names were Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker. By 1931, Frank Hamer was in Austin, Texas, investigating the rising Communist Party of Texas. Communism was gaining popularity as Americans became disillusioned with the current volatility of the capitalist free market, and red protests were commonplace. As Ranger Captain, Frank warned big oil companies in Texas, Kansas, and Oklahoma of the threat of terrorism from communist extremists. In 1932, he and the Rangers investigated election fraud in Gregg County, Texas, where there had been a great many more votes than registered voters. Fraud on the part of Ma Ferguson, a longtime critic of the Texas Rangers, was suspected. After Ma won the runoff election, she fired all members of the Rangers after she took office in January of 1933. Frank was out of a job, right in the middle of the Great Depression. He was passed over by the Roosevelt administration for the open U.S. Marshal position, even though he was by far the most experienced and competent candidate. Frank would hold a grudge against FDR for the rest of his life, and he would become a Republican in large part to being passed over. However, it wasn't this presidential snub but destiny itself that ensured Frank was unemployed and sitting idle at the beginning of 1934. On the 1st of February, 1934, fate in the form of Lee Simmons would arrive at his front door in Austin. Simmons was the superintendent of the Texas prison system, and he had one very direct question for Frank. Would he track down the Barrow gang? Less than a month earlier, Clyde Barrow had orchestrated a prison break for a former gang member. One of Simmons' guards was killed in the escape, and he was out for blood. Frank was interested from the word go. He needed a job. But more than that, the draw of hunting down a band of heartless killers infamous throughout the country was something he simply couldn't pass up. After being promised that Simmons and Governor Ferguson would give him all resources at their disposal to get the job done, Frank accepted and he was given a salary of $180 a month and the title of Special Investigator. Clyde Barrow first got into trouble when he and his family moved to the West Texas slums in 1922. He got in with the wrong crowd and by 13 was part of a gang known for stealing chickens. Like many young criminals, he started out small, but his level of crime increased quickly. By 1926, he had been arrested and charged for automobile theft for failing to return a rental, and apart from part-time gigs, his main source of income was burglary and theft. The only way to save young people is by getting them when they're young, getting them out of a bad family situation, getting them into a proper school, having proper mentoring and that kind of thing for them. And what I say in my biography of Frank Hamer is that Clyde Barrow's parents were the worst two of the worst parents in Texas history. Of their seven children, five of them became convicted felons. 
Two of them were killed by law enforcement officers. The family was impoverished, but less impoverished than Frank Hamer's family. Frank Hamer grew up in even worse circumstances. The 1880s were worse than the 1920s. And so uh, there's no excuse for their criminal career. He met Bonnie Parker in January of 1930. Bonnie was a petite, book-smart 19-year-old with a vulgar mouth. She became a notorious prostitute in the Dallas Red Light District, and her fatal flaw was her love for bad boys. In Clyde, she found just what she was looking for. Clyde was sentenced to 14 years in prison in April of 1930. Two years into his sentence, he had one of his fellow inmates use an axe to cut off two of his toes, with the hope that the injury would gain him a transfer or even a lighter sentence. Incredibly, the crutch using Barrow was paroled the following year and returned to Bonnie in Dallas. He quickly pulled together a group of former criminal friends and former convicts and began a catalogue of holdups in North Texas. Bonnie was captured in one of these burglaries and spent three months in prison. Clyde committed his first murder in April of 1932 when he and gangmate Ray Hamilton held up fill station owner John Butcher. When Butcher reached for a pistol, Clyde shot him and left the man bleeding out while rummaging through the upstairs, then fleeing into the night with a mere $20 and some jewellery. That October, Clyde's body count would increase to two. He walked into a grocery store and made a small purchase, a routine that had become his modus operandi. When the clerk opened the register, Clyde pulled his 45 and took all the cash. When the store butcher, Howard Hall, protested, Clyde hit him over the head with a pistol grip and turned. A moment later, Hall reached for the gun, and Clyde unloaded three bullets into Hall, killing him. He was about to shoot the clerk too, but when the pistol jammed, Clyde and his men took off into the night. Hall left behind a wife and son. Over the next year, the Barrow Gang would get into numerous shootouts with the law, rob several banks as far north as Indiana and Minnesota, and continue to evade the pursuits of law enforcement. They even shot their way out of a bank robbery in the small town of Okabina, Minnesota, narrowly missing a school bus full of children. Clyde would drive hundreds of miles, sometimes even up to a thousand miles straight. The high mileage was the key to the gang's ability to sidestep law enforcement time and time again. By the summer of 1933, their good fortune would take a turn. While driving through the Texas Panhandle, Clyde misjudged a turn and his Ford flipped and burst into flames. Bonnie had her legs severely burned in the accident, and she would be left with a distinctive limp for the remainder of her short life. They continued the same pattern throughout the rest of the year, holding up fill stations, banks and grocery stores throughout the South and Midwest, getting into countless shootouts with police. Somehow, by hook or by crook, they always ended up escaping, and then turning up hundreds of miles away the next day to prey on yet another unsuspecting victim. A far cry from the romanticized version told in film adaptations of their lives, Bonnie and Clyde were consistently without adequate food, slept in cars they stole, camped at backcountry sites, and bathed in creeks. But perhaps the greatest lie told about them was that they were modern-day Robin Hoods, stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. The fact that they themselves were poor growing up was the only true part of this. Although they did pull off a few big bank jobs and split the cash evenly with the members of the gang, the vast majority of the holdups they perpetrated were on small business owners, poor and lower middle class folks simply trying to earn an honest living. But on January 16th of 1934, the gang would pull off a job that, though successful, would signal the beginning of the end of their reign of terror and bloodshed. Bonnie, Clyde, and gang member James Mullen hatched a plan for a prison break from Easton Prison Farm. Picking up the guns that had been stashed three days before, the prisoners shot two of the guards and took off in the waiting forward, signaled by the honking of Bonnie Parker. Four prisoners escaped, one of them by the name of Henry Methvin. The couple didn't know it at the time, but Methvin would soon have a crucial role in bringing them to justice. The prison break hit papers all over Texas, 
further highlighting the evil deeds of the Barrow Gang. It also heightened the attention of law enforcement to put an end to them. It was at this moment when Frank Hamer entered the story of Bonnie and Clyde. After being offered the job by prison superintendent Lee Simmons, Frank Hamer was on the case, and he would soon do what the FBI and law enforcement in 12 states had failed to do, bring down Bonnie and Clyde. The day after Simmons had visited Frank's home, the Barrow Gang had robbed a bank in Coleman, Texas and made off with $24,000, about half a million dollars today. A week later, Frank loaded up his Ford V8 and set off on his last great hunt. The quintessential investigator, Frank took the time to learn everything he could about Bonnie and Clyde. From the whiskey they drank, to the cigars they smoked, their clothing and their shoe sizes, and many of their tricks and habits. In March, Frank visited the convict named Hilton Bybee at a prison in East Texas to interrogate him. Bybee had been part of the Barrow Gang for just a few weeks, but Frank had a feeling he had valuable intelligence about the gang's comings and goings. Convincing him he had a mountain of evidence against him, enough to keep him in prison for a very long time, Bybee broke and spilled. He told Frank that the Barrow Gang kept a fairly consistent pattern of movement, a circular route through North Texas, Oklahoma, and Missouri, then south again through Arkansas, all the way to Louisiana. Sheriffs in the Beanville Parish of Louisiana had been keeping tabs in the family of Henry Methvin. His father Ivan had a rental house in the parish that was thought to be used by the Barrow Gang when they were visiting Louisiana and law enforcement kept the family on a close watch starting at the end of March 1934. Frank was home visiting Gladys for Easter Sunday when a news report came over the radio. Sheeper believes he saw Clyde Barrow, bandit, and Bonnie Parker, who poses as his wife. Barrow, wanted for nine killings, is believed to be responsible for the later murder of an Oklahoma policeman. Farmer Schieffer will now tell you how the bandits greeted two Texas motorcycle policemen who approached them. One was standing on either side of the car. They reached down and got their gun and came up when they were about 10 feet away and says, boom, 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 boom. The automatic shotgun, the man on the steering wheel side shot the man in front. The one on the other side shot over the radio and shot the man in the rear. The man in front fell flat on his back. The other man sort of spun around and fell with his face down the other way. The two motorbike police officers had approached the Barrow's vehicle to check if they were motorists in need of assistance. Bonnie and Clyde, who stood outside, drew their shotguns and opened fire. The patrolmen were both hit with buckshot and they crumpled to the ground. The couple then walked over to the two men writhing in agony, pointed their weapons at them point blank, and fired the fatal shots. Then they took off in their vehicle. One of the officers, his fiance, wore her wedding dress to her fiance's funeral. And if that isn't the saddest thing you've ever heard about a death of a law enforcement officer, then I, I don't know what is. Frank met with Lee Simmons in Austin, and the pair discussed how they would redouble their efforts to catch Bonnie and Clyde. Frank sought the help of former Ranger Manny Galt and Dallas County Sheriff Robert Fitz Alcorn. By May, all eyes and ears of law enforcement were centered around Arcadia, Louisiana, where it was believed the Barrow Gang was set to pay their usual visit to the Methvin family. For the next couple of weeks, Frank, Galt, and Alcorn would have to bide their time. They sticked out the home suspected of being the Barrow's safe house, an old abandoned house of a couple who had passed away a few years prior. Hamer contacted the Methvin family with the local sheriff, Henderson Jordan, and uh, he made a, uh, an arrangement with old man Methvin that uh, Methvin would inform on Bonnie and Clyde. They would come and visit maybe once a month or so, and they'd stay for three or four days 
and old man Methvin was just scared to death that his son Henry would either be killed with Bonnie and Clyde or was going to end up in prison. So Hamer got a promise from Governor Ferguson that he would be, receive a pardon or clemency for the crimes he committed in Texas if his family rolled over on Bonnie and Clyde. And that's exactly what happened. Frank and his posse hatched a plan to take Bonnie and Clyde on the winding dirt road leading to the safe house, running between Gibsland and Sales. They cased the narrow road up and down before finding a spot atop a small hill with a large ditch on one side. One can clearly see for a good distance in either direction. This is where they would make their ambush. Back at the inn the men were staying at, on the night of May 22nd, Frank got a call from Sheriff Henderson Jordan. Come to Arcadia at once. Get your man if you can. It was time to spring this trap. Frank brought with him four good men. Prentice Oakley, Bob Alcorn, Ted Hinton, and Manny Galt. So Manny Galt uh, was sort of a neighbor of Frank Hamer. Hamer got to know him because he lived in Austin. Manny Galt lived in the southern South Austin, is what it's called today. And uh, during the Prohibition era, Hamer used Manny Galt as an informant to go in sometimes and buy liquor uh, or to advise him when bootleggers were bringing liquor in, that kind of thing, kind of as an undercover agent. And then uh, uh, Hamer decided to use him got him a job as a ranger, but then Galt, like Hamer, had lost his job when Ma Ferguson became governor. And so Manny Galt at that time was a fairly inexperienced officer. Uh, the only experienced officer in the final posse that Hamer put together was Bob Alcorn, who had a, a seven, eight, nine years experience as a deputy sheriff in Dallas, Texas. The rest of the officers in the posse had less than two years apiece uh, as uh, in law enforcement. Uh, Hamer had more experience than the entire posse combined, way more experience. And uh, just in years to say nothing of making, you know, hundreds and if not thousands of felony arrests, these 52 gunfights that he'd been in, that kind of thing. The man set up with Sheriff Jordan, who told them that Ivy Methvin had informed them that the couple were on their way. They caught up with Methvin and had him bring his truck to their ambush site and park it on the right side of the road. They ordered him to jack up the truck and take off one of the tires. This would act as a lure for Clyde as he drove up the road towards them so they could achieve the full element of surprise. I hailed a position on the extreme left, and next was Galt, Jordan, Alcorn, Oakley, and Hinton. If the car got past us, Hinton was to step out and bust the engine with a Browning machine gun. Sheriff Jordan insisted that they at least give the fugitives a chance to give themselves up. Hamer disagreed. Though he didn't wish harm on Bonnie, he refused the idea of giving Clyde any quarter. Frank didn't want to see another lawman die at the end of Clyde's gun. Uh, all night, Hamer and the sheriff, Henderson Jordan, had been arguing. Hamer wanted to just open fire and kill them instantly. Jordan insisted on stepping out and giving them a chance to surrender. Hamer says, you'll die. They've killed, already killed eight or ten law enforcement officers. They're going to kill you too. We can't give them any quarter. Finally, Jordan wins. Hamer understands, you know, if this is Jordan's parish. He's the sheriff. In Louisiana, of course, a parish is what we call a county everywhere else. But he relented, and it was agreed that they would step out into the road and order the pair to surrender before opening fire. The wait for the car was an excruciating one. This was the moment they had been anticipating for a long while. The adrenaline had been pumping through their body, but as three o'clock in the morning turned to four, then five, then six. Their adrenaline turned to anxiety and then drowsiness. Not having brought food for a long stakeout, the men grew hungry, but managed to keep their nerve by applying a bit of humor. After Sheriff Jordan called out how the food was, 
Hinton replied, I've eaten the stock off your rifle and I'm starting on the barrel. By nine in the morning, they were all ready to call it. They were tired, hungry, and their diets told them that this was just a ruse by Methvin. But not 15 minutes later, Alcorn spotted a tan-colored Ford V8 heading their way, going at a good old rate. As the car got closer within a few hundred yards, it seemed to slow. The driver had clearly seen the obstruction Methvin's truck presented. Alcorn peered out of the brush, and his keen eye spotted what they had all been waiting for. It's Barrow. The Parker woman's with him. Then, they all gave an instinctive click to the safety of their weapons, loaded a round into the chamber, and gripped their weapons firmly. Not a man amongst them showed the slightest bit of nerves. The town forward kept on coming, then slowed to a steady stop about 50 feet from Methvin's pickup and sat idling. A truck loaded with timber was waiting behind Clyde, and after confirming Methvin needed assistance, Clyde pulled forward to let it pass. In an instant, Prentice Oakley jumped to his feet and aimed his rifle at Barrow. Oh! Came an order from the posse of men, who had emerged from their position in the ditch and had now enveloped Clyde's Ford. Oakley fired off a shot at the car, and the others watched as Clyde reached to his right and Bonnie raised the pistol. The next thing they knew, there was nothing but shooting. You have these, what we call sympathetic fire today, where one officer will fire his weapon, the other officers hear it and almost instinctively start shooting as well. And that's probably what happened. You know, we weren't there. It's possible the officers saw them go for a gun, but what's most likely and what most of the accounts are in agreement on is that the one deputy fired and then everybody else immediately opened fire. Either way, Bonnie and Clyde got what they deserved. The two notorious fugitive killers, responsible for the murder of 14 people, who had eluded one of the most far-reaching manhunts in law enforcement history, were dead. I hated to have to shoot her, but as they drove up, I recalled how she had helped Barrow kill nine peace officers. If you're an officer sworn to do your duty, you can't afford to feel mercy. If it wouldn't have been her, it would have been us. This was the first time in his long career that Frank had physically harmed a woman, and he was honestly sickened at the sight of Bonnie Parker's body riddled with bullet holes. Crime scene investigators counted 167 bullets and buckshot embedded in Clyde's Ford V8. Bonnie had been struck with 41, and the number was 58 for Clyde. In 2008, the FBI file on Bonnie and Clyde was found in a file cabinet in the basement of the courthouse in Dallas, Texas. Bonnie and Clyde buffs, of which there are hundreds and hundreds of them, found out about it. They pestered the FBI to release it. The FBI did release it under the various laws of uh, you know, public information acts and that kind of thing, but they redacted all the names. And these folks who are experts and know a lot more about Bonnie and Clyde than I do, told the FBI, look, these people have been dead 50 years. Why are you redacting their names? So finally, they redacted the names, they released it. You can even buy it or you could buy it on a CD. Portions of it were on the FBI website. And those are the original FBI reports, which include all kinds of correspondence, uh, interviews with criminals, members of the gang, uh, correspondence with Frank Hamer, for example, and detailed records of what Hamer did. So I was able to get a copy of that, and that was the first time anybody really knew the true story of how Bonnie and Clyde were tracked down by Frank Hamer. Frank and Alcorn drove back to the town of Gibsland where Frank phoned Lee Simmons to tell him the news. He then called his wife Gladys to tell her he was all right and that he would be home the next day. 
By the time the two men had returned to the site of the killings, over 200 vehicles lined the dirt road as locals tried to get a glimpse of the slain couple and a score of spent bullet or one of Bonnie's belongings as a souvenir. Police collected two sawed-off shotguns, three automatic rifles, ten pistols, and about a thousand rounds of ammunition from the vehicle. Frank received a call from New York asking him for an interview that promised him a thousand dollars for a few minutes of his time. He flatly declined. Lee Simmons, who was with Frank when he took the call, recounted, He slammed that receiver on that hook, cussed a blue streak, and mad as a hornet. I know man who would have leaped at the publicity, to say nothing of the thousand dollars. But not Hamer. He's not built that way. When asked later about the trap he had set for Barrow, Frank made up a tale about a mailbox Clyde would visit on Tuesdays. He said that they had waited at the mailbox, and that this was how they had finally caught up with Barrow. This was Frank's way of protecting Ivy Methvin and his family, and keeping his promise to Methvin to never speak publicly about his involvement in the setup. Frank never profited financially from the media coverage of Bonnie and Clyde's killing. Incredibly, he wasn't even reimbursed for the expenses incurred while on the hunt until 1945, mostly due to the fact that he kept no receipts, since doing so would have surely blown his cover. Though he had countless monetary offers for interviews and book deals, he declined them. One publisher contacted him with a book offer and asked what $10,000 would mean to him. He responded, No more than a Mexican dime. Frank was sporadically involved in ranger activities throughout the 30s and 40s. He helped keep the peace in the Texas Gulf as a wave of Union strikes hit the oil and shipping companies. In 1948, he was involved in the investigation of voter fraud by Lyndon B. Johnson, who was running for a Texas Senate seat. You know, his last important case was the uh, rigged election in South Texas in which Lyndon B. Johnson was elected United States Senator through ballot box stuffing in South Texas. Frank Hamer led the investigation, uncovered the stuffed ballot box, proved beyond any reasonable doubt in Robert Caro, in his biographies of LBJ, documents it extensively as I do in my book. Retiring in 1949, Frank lived out a comfortable life for the remainder of his years. He had a heart attack in 1955 at the age of 71, and death finally took the man who had been wounded 17 times and who had been on the edge of death at least four times. Many years later, he would say that he was in 52 gunfights in his career. This is more than any American lawman, and I've been researching this since 1968. He killed 23 men in the line of duty, not including Bonnie and Clyde. Now today, you'd say this is horrible. You know, we need to have the United States attorney uh, uh, investigate him for police brutality. And this is a different era. Law and order is the respect and obedience of the rule of law in society. It is something that requires a steady hand, cool temper, and a balanced view of judgment and compassion. Frank Hamer was the exemplar of this throughout his career. Many will point out that Bonnie and Clyde didn't have a chance to choose another path in life. Their upbringing was less than ideal, to say the least. Their life of crime was not just encouraged by their childhood experience, it was almost guaranteed. But tell that to the families of shopkeepers Ray Hamilton and Howard Hall, and those of patrolman H.D. Murphy and Edward Wheeler. Heinous crime must be punished. The deterrent for such crimes must be so great that one thinking of committing them has to think twice, because the consequences vastly outweigh the potential gain. Frank had his own fork in the road moment early in life, but he chose the right path. From the time he was a young boy, he had a fundamental understanding of right and wrong, something he learned from his grandfather. Well, to me, it became very evident uh, while researching my book, that he's the greatest American lawman of the 20th century. The important cases that he handled, 
His career was just unbelievable. His legacy is twofold. Uh, certainly there were things that he did. Uh, he opened fire in gunfights without warning. Today you'd go to prison for doing that. On the other hand, as a captain of the Texas Rangers, he led the fight against lynching in Texas in the 1920s. This is an era in which law enforcement officers were lynched for protecting black people. And Hamer could care less. He just didn't care what people thought about him. He had this strong moral compass and uh, let that guide him through his entire career. And I think his legacy is that. If anything, killing Bonnie and Clyde was the least significant incident of his career. He was by no means a perfect man, but he learned from the times he allowed his temper to get the better of him. And he considered honesty, something one not just sought from others, but demanded from oneself. A bronze statue of him now stands in Navasota, Texas, the town he marshaled for five years early in his career. It depicts a young man, broad-shouldered, firm-jawed, and toting a rifle over his shoulder. A cowboy, gunfighter, clan resistor, ranger captain, and fugitive killer. They say I'm a good shot. I know I am. But as long as I'm doing what is right, and I'm always trying to cut it square, there's something of higher help that's looked down the barrel with me and told me when to pull the trigger. This episode of Virtuous Men was written and recorded by Jamie Adams and edited by Scott Einig. Hamer quotations read by John Gallagher. A very special thanks to author John Bosnicker for his insight on the life of Frank Hamer. If you enjoyed this episode, give us a rating and leave a review in the comments section. And don't forget to check out more Virtuous Men on our Instagram page at virtuous underscore men and give us a follow. Tune in next time for episode 3, where we discover the ambition of Michelangelo.